Praise the Lord. Pastor Fields here. It's another Wednesday. The Lord has allowed us to come together to share a word with you and to focus on the goodness of the Lord and to meditate on the message that the Lord is conveying to us this hour. Certainly, we all need a word from the Lord. We all need encouragement correction at times, whatever we need, it's all in God's word. I want to thank you for connecting with Greater Refuge Temple here in Washington, D.C. and Refuge Temple Annex in the Bronx. Those of you who faithfully uh, come in and join us in Bible study, we thank you so much. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. This is another day, Lord, that you have kept us, and we thank you. Kept us from all evil with our minds stayed on Jesus. Bless us now as we go into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you. <clears throat> Tonight I'm in the book of Jude. I'm in the book of Jude. Now you know Jude is only one chapter, so when you get there, you're there. Um, and um, our focused verse is going to be verse number three. And um, my subject tonight is defending the faith in these last days. Defending the faith in these last days. Um, the letter of Jude, of course, was written by uh, its namesake. And the theme of his letter is contending for the faith. Uh, he writes to repudiate, repudiate I should say, uh, many of the false teachings that were circulating among the brethren. Uh, things were going on outside of the church, but there was a lot of confusion going on inside of the church because of false teaching. So here, uh, and I'll start at verse 1. I'll read Jude 1, 2, and 3. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Very important letter that was written uh, by Jude. And he begins, when he began this letter, it was, it was written to share um, the common salvation that they have. Uh, it was it was a joy to share the fact that this is a joy, the salvation that we have. It is a joy to have it. Um, but as he begins to write the letter, we see that the Holy Spirit compels him to make an appeal to the people of God, to the apostolics, to those who are reading this letter to earnestly contend for the faith uh, that was once for all entrusted to the saints of God. Now, um, one translation puts it like this. Listen to my notes. Put up a real fight for the faith, which has once for all committed to those who belong to Christ. So uh, we're reminded our solemn duty as born again believers is not to just walk around bragging about our salvation, but really also to defend the faith, put up a fight for it. Um, verse 1, let's go there. Uh, Jude, verse 1, uh, he's telling us, uh, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So um, in verse 1, he's telling us that we've been called. We have been called 
and who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. But the third verse tells us that we're not only to rejoice and enjoy the blessings of the gospel, we're not only to spread and propagate the good news that others may be saved, but we are also to defend the gospel. I know I'm enjoying my salvation, but we have a responsibility not just to sing and shout and to praise and to glorify God, but we have a responsibility to defend the faith. Um, listen to my notes. This certainly was the case here while uh, Jude was, wrote this letter, A.D. 66. Uh, but we're still going through today. The church is still going through many things. Uh, verse 4 makes it clear. Um, verse number four makes it very clear. I'll read it for you. Jude chapter one, verse four says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so he's telling them up front, there are people who have come in, walked through the doors, and their job, their assignment has been to subvert, uh, to undergird, to try to tear apart those things that have been established doctrinally, those things that you have been taught, things you have been trained to do. Um, these are coming in now telling you that you don't have to do this anymore. It's not necessary. Um, in those days, um, Jude was letting them know that we have wolves uh, among us in sheep's clothing. Hallelujah. And, and the, same, the same is going on today. Listen to what, what the Word of God says in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 29. Uh, I believe this is Paul uh, talking to the brethren. Listen to what he says. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So uh, I would dare say tonight in, in our lesson, um, it, this is a double-edged sword. Not only are we to be aware and alert of things that are happening outside the church, but we should particularly be concerned about those things uh, that at, at work that are not right within the church. Uh, why? Well, because there are many false prophets. When I say many, and the Bible tells us many false prophets uh, will rise. Many will come in my name, Jesus said. Uh, but today, there are so many false prophets, so many out there. Uh, not just here in America, but all over. There are so many claiming to be prophets of God uh, who are not sent by God. Uh, they're doing the work of the enemy. And it's our clear duty. It's not just for the preacher to do. It's for everyone who has been filled with the Holy Ghost, every born-again believer, every word-professing, confessing believer, should defend the truth, defend the faith. Um, I want to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse number 13. I'll read verse 13 through 15. Uh, it, it sounds like this. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Um, so it, it was a problem then. It's a problem now. The enemy dresses like us, looks like us, sings like us, preaches like us. Uh, and we have to be alert. We have to be aware. Uh, because there are many false prophets, false teachings, 
false concepts, heresies that are being spread under the banner of gospel, and it's not the gospel. Uh, and Judah saying, instead of just sitting there saying amen to everything, you need to defend the faith. you got to defend it. Yes, especially in these last days. Jesus is coming soon. Uh, and there's scripture that says uh, those the last days, there'll be times where even the very elect will be deceived. So let's answer a few questions. What are we defending? What are we to defend? Um, according to Jude, we are to defend the faith that was once entrusted to the saints. What is that? Well, we are to defend the whole body of revealed truth, which is contained in the whole inspired canon of Scripture. So we are to defend Genesis through Revelation. This is the word of God, infallible. This is the word of God. Everything in it is according to his mind, his will, his purpose. And we are to defend that faith that is entrusted in us. The whole uh, inspired canon of scripture. The word of God. So, and we are told four things uh, about this deposit of truth that has been put in our hearts and minds and spirits. This word of God. Um, number one, um, it is divine in its origin. So what was entrusted to the saints is divine in its origin. It's God's word. By whom? Uh, by man? No. Man cannot... Uh, be the originator of anything that's divine. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture. And again, those of you who are going to be catechized this year, this is on the catechism. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, by inspiration of God, not man, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness. Let's go to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God is the author and the finisher of the faith, uh, which he has entrusted to the saints of God. Uh, through holy men of God, the Holy Ghost moved upon them and they spoke what thus saith the Lord. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of man. No, out of the mouth of God. So not only is it uh, the word of God divine in origin, this faith that was entrusted to us, not only is it divine in origin, but it is unique in its content. It is unique in its content. So there is no other faith. There's no other gospel. There's no other word. No, this is the one perfect revelation of God. So he's careful to define. He is specific in what he is talking about. It is the faith that was entrusted. It is not a faith. It is not a word. It is the word. This is it. Don't look for no other gospel. And even if an angel come down from heaven preaching any other gospel, let him be a curse. This is it. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Listen. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, 
who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hallelujah. My God. The next thing we have to say about this faith that was entrusted to us after discussing that its origin is divine, uh, it's unique in content, we also understand that it is complete in its revelation. There's no brand new revelation. It is complete in its revelation. It is a complete and final revelation, which will never need addition or revision. You can't correct God's word. No, nope. you can't change God's word. Uh, his word is his word. The faith is the faith. Uh, and it is complete. God completed the revelation of his truth. God completed. There is a doctrine. Listen to this. Listen to my notes. There is a doctrine of the progressive revelation of truth. But the progressive revelation begins in the book of Genesis and it ends in Revelation. This is it. Don't look for no other gospel, no other word, no other revelation. Uh, and um, Understand that it's holy in its nature, the nature of the faith, the nature of the word, <laughs> the nature of what was entrusted to us is holy. Hallelujah. It's holy. It's holy. Everything about God is holy. His word is holy. His will is holy. And his people are to be holy. The faith that I have is holy. So let's go to Jude um, verse 20. Jude verse 20. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So this faith is holy. It was given by a holy God through the Holy Spirit, through holy men. This is why now what is spoken to us comes from holy scriptures to produce holy living. Hallelujah. And leading men and women to a holy city. My God. I like that. I'm going to say that again. Our faith, this faith that we should be contending for, this word that has been deposited in us, the ways of God. It's holy in nature, right? Given by a holy God through the Holy Spirit, through holy men. It's called the Holy Scriptures, and it is to produce in us holy living, right? And leading men and women to a holy city. Let's go to Revelation 21 and 10. Listen, and he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Don't know about you, but I want to make it into that city. Hallelujah. And you can't make it believing a lie, living a lie, embracing a lie. You better hold on to the truth. Don't let it go. Hallelujah. So Jude mentions uh, in all that we talked about, Jude is mentioning most of the fundamental articles of our faith, the fundamental, the foundational articles of what apostolics believe, of this faith. This is what we are to defend, right? Um, let's, let's run through it. I wish I had the time to really dig into this because there's a, there's a lot of chocolate in here. It's, it is decadent. It is rich. Uh, but Jude mentions uh, in most, in all of this, he mentions most, uh, perhaps not all, but most of the fundamental articles of our faith, the things uh, that say who we are, what we uh, hold on to, uh, and we are to defend it. The first thing uh, Jude says he mentions that God is the father of all who believe. 
Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, and him that are sanctified by God. Who sanctified you? Who separated you? Who called you? By God, the Father. So uh, it is a fundamental belief that God is the Father of all who believe. Uh, talks about the glorious person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's important because there was a false teaching saying uh, that Jesus was not who he said he was. Some had begun to teach that he didn't even exist, right? Some even teaching this now uh, because we can't find any records, no birth certificate or, uh, you know, just making up stuff. But Jude says, for there are, there are certain men crept in the wares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, their ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Listen, not only turning the grace of our God into lusty, worldly, fleshly living, deviant from what is normal, they're denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. So this teaching was denying the personhood of Christ. He's not the son of God. This is what they were teaching. He's not who he says he was. Um, but he's saying you should defend that. Yes, Jesus, Jesus is the son of God. Not only this, John took it even further. Hallelujah. And said his word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So he opened up deeper the revelation, letting us know, uh, even through the words of Christ himself, if you see me, you see my father. Uh, and I, I wish I had more time to just dive all the way in it. Uh, but he talks about the doctrine of the grace of God. Again, that's in verse 4. Uh, they, they crept in the wear, uh, and they turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. The total depravity of man uh, is part of what we teach Part of what we talk about, depravity, even as Sodom and Gomorrah uh, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, the depravity of man, even in today's time, people don't want you to talk about how depraved and how sinful we are, right? Right. Even in church, uh, people are, are fighting and saying, don't preach certain things. Uh, don't say certain things. You don't want to offend people. Don't tell them the truth anymore. Don't preach against or teach against homosexuality uh, or fornication or adultery. Just, just tell them to pay their tithes, give them the offering. Uh, and, and Judah's saying, you have to you have to defend the truth. Tell the truth. Hallelujah. Defend what we believe, right? Um, he talks about the personality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's, that's in verse 19. These by they who separate themselves sensual, not having the Holy Spirit. They were sensual. They were not spiritual. Everything they were presenting, everything they do is according to flesh. Uh, and that is totally against what we teach concerning the reality and the behavior of the Holy Ghost. Bishop Bonner, a lot of times, would cross his legs and, and he would say this, The Holy Ghost does not behave himself unseemly. Hallelujah. Um, one of the other foundational principles uh, Jude alludes to is in verse number nine, where he alludes to um, the existence of a devil, the existence of an evil one. Uh, he says, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Uh, so he's, he's referring to the fact that there is an enemy, there is a devil. Hallelujah, who wants you to be in hell with him. Uh, but there are those who were teaching then and even alluding to the fact now that there's no hell to worry about. And that's a lie. Hallelujah, that's not true word. That's not true doctrine. That's not the faith. No, 
As a matter of fact, the word of God says hell is enlarging himself. Was hell built for you and I? No. Uh, but it seems like people are determined to go there. Uh, but Jesus said, I'm preparing a place for you, my children, that where I am, there you may be also. Uh, listen, uh, Jude alludes to the fact uh, of judgment and hell. Verses 6 through 7. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, hath he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, eternal fire. That sounds like hell to me. Eternal fire. Why? Because they would not give up their sins. And in today's time, people are preaching and uh, and teaching. Uh, and, and when you sit down and, and decipher what they're talking about, they're actually almost giving you a license to do whatever you want to do. Live any way you want to live. God will accept it. And that's, that's not true. Listen to verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So there's going to be judgment for those uh, who would not receive the salvation of Christ and wanted to live totally contrary uh, to holiness. So um, he talks about the justification of the sinner by faith. Verse 11. Hallelujah. He covers a whole lot. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Hallelujah. Uh, he alludes to the personal return of Christ. That's in verse number 14. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his angels, because there was false teaching then and even now, <coughs> excuse me, that there'll be no rapture of the saints. Uh, some uh, are arguing when the rapture is going to take place, but there were those who were teaching that there's no such thing. There is no rapture. Jesus is not coming. What a lie. Hallelujah. You better hold on to the truth. The truth will make you free. Hold on to the truth. Uh, he alludes to the eternal security of believers. Uh, it was a song years ago the Templets used to sing, an RTA, eternal security. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Hallelujah. Talks about the sovereignty and the keeping power of God. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, not only now, but forever. Hallelujah. So, um, the last thing uh, that he touches on, the historical accuracy and the prophetic value of the Old Testament. You, you, you can't just rip out the Old Testament and focus on the New Testament, you have to take the whole book, the whole book, and you have to uh, understand and appreciate the historical accuracy and prophetic value of the Old and the New Testament scriptures. And you get that from reading verses 5 through 19. I wish I had the time. Maybe I should just go on and read it. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of that great day. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. We've, we've read it. Uh, go to verse 8. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Hallelujah. So he gives us, uh, and he's giving us historical accuracy uh, because he talks about the angel wrestling for the body of Moses. Uh, so he goes into Old Testament uh, 
prophetic word and things that happen in the Old Testament, uh, and it's accurate. Hallelujah. And it's all the word of God. We all believe. I believe, yes, that my God stepped out into the midst of nothing and said, let there be and there in the beginning God. Hallelujah. So he says, defend all of that. Don't let anybody pull you away from entrusting. Hallelujah. Embrace the word of God. This is God's word. The Holy Scriptures contend for the faith. Hallelujah. So this is what we are to defend. The next question after what is why? <laughs> Why are we to defend the word of God? Why should I defend the apostolic way, the faith? I believe in God. I believe in his word. He is a holy and righteous, loving God, and he is a righteous judge. Hallelujah. I believe everything in his word from, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, but why should we defend the faith? Why? Why should we defend the faith? Well, uh, the answer is simple, because the faith is under attack constantly, consistently. The faith is being attacked. Hallelujah. The, the, the fundamental truths that we believe, the things that we hold to be true, the things that have been embedded in us. Hallelujah. Uh, everything and so much more that I've discussed before getting to the why we should defend the faith uh, is because it's being attacked, uh, it's being denied, it's being thrown out, hallelujah, it's being ridiculed, not only, listen, not only by people who are outside of the church, but people who are in the church are twisting and turning the word of God. Now, it, it's, it's gotten so bad to the point now, uh, Anybody looking would say, well, what do y'all believe in? Hallelujah. What, what, what is going on? Because they're, they're, it's not just an outside attack, but it's an inside, right inside the church. Hallelujah. The truth of God, the faith, the very flux, the very foundation of who we are is being attacked. So if we go back through the 12 points that I just went through, uh, God is the Father, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of grace, the total depravity of man, the personality of the Holy Ghost, the existence of uh, the devil, the fact that, that there is going to be judgment in hell, hallelujah, the, the justification of sinners by faith, the personal return of Christ for his church, the eternal security of believers, the sovereignty and the keeping power of my God, and the historical accuracy of the prophetic value of the Old and New Testament scriptures. Hallelujah. Listen, if you read through all of that again, uh, my God, you see that all of that, what I just discussed, and so much more about the truth and the word of God, hallelujah, that we meditate on day and night is under attack, is being denied. Hallelujah. I went to, I went to school with a... a a young man, his name was Bruce. He used to spend so much time trying to convince me that this Bible is nothing but a bunch of fairy tales. And I would get so mad at him and upset. I said, no, uh, this is God's word. I, was, I wasn't even filled with the Holy Ghost then. Uh, it, it was in elementary school. I said, nope, this is the word of God. Hallelujah. Everything in it is true. You can't be afraid to open up your mouth and defend the faith. Hallelujah. Listen, because much of the much of the teaching in schools, even in religious schools, even in seminary, hallelujah, seminarians, they, they go in and they come out uh, teaching things that are totally against the faith. Where do they get that from? So uh, much of the religious teaching in our schools, in the media, I don't even, I could spend two hours talking about social media. Uh, it's, a it's a direct denial of the truth of God that's been revealed in his word. This denial has percolated into most 
most of our denominational colleges, uh, many of our pulpits, some of the things that you see on TV or hear on the radio, uh, things that are supposed to be uh, called Christian literature. It's nothing but humanism. Uh, it's, it's nothing but nothing but flesh, philosophy. Hallelujah. It's not based on the life-changing word of God, right? And uh, this is why you hear so many people say, well, this is my truth. Or you'll hear movie stars or people who are put in the limelight on TV. They'll, they'll talk as though God might exist. They'll just say uh, uh, a superpower or a man upstairs. Anything to diminish or, or to put a, a spot or to bring doubt, right? Uh, so confused. So confused. I can I can name names of people we see on TV all the time, uh, and instead of following the faith and following the truth, people are leaving the truth and following them. But you need to hold on to the truth and defend it, because so much is being preached and taught, right? Uh, but it's not the word of God. It's not according to faith. And the Bible says, if it's done outside of faith, it's sin. Hallelujah. Well, I would have to say uh, that prophecy is being fulfilled. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. This know also, right? And we're talking about defending the faith in these last days. Yeah. 2 Timothy, I'll give you time to go there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 through 8. Let's read what it says. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Wow. This is Paul talking to Timothy about when the last days perilous times are going to come. And Judas is giving us a directive saying, you, you need to defend that faith, hallelujah, because they're going to be people preaching and teaching and singing things that are totally contrary to the faith. You shouldn't be singing along or saying amen to something that is contrary to the faith. Let's go to chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as his, at his appearing and his kingdom. This is what he tells the young preacher. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Imagine that. He's warning the young man, you're going you're gonna to run into people who will turn their ears away from the truth and will be turned into fables. I rather, you mean to tell me that we're, we're in the time where people rather hear lies than the truth, when the Bible says the truth makes you free, not lies, not false doctrine. It's 
the truth. My Lord, this is, it's been prophesied. It's been said. Judah saying, but we ought to defend the faith. We ought to stand up for the truth. Where are the saints? Where are those who have the word of God embedded in their hearts and minds? They're very fine. But where are the people of God? Hallelujah. That understand that God's word is true. Where are? Where are the offended? And by that I mean where are the saints that are offended by the sins of this world? Hallelujah. Who hate the sins of this world. Who are willing to open up their mouths and say, Jesus saves. You don't have to die and go to hell. Where are the people who will stand up even in the house of God and say, I refuse to turn away from the truth. We had to stand up for it. Hallelujah. Why? Why should the people of God be silent when our precious faith is being attacked? And when some are supposed even to be our leaders, our spiritual leaders, those leaders who at one time told us that we must be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gives the utterance. And now they're telling us that it's not necessary. The devil is a liar. Somebody needs to stand up and say, it's true. We must repent and be baptized, every one of us. For the remission of our sins. Hallelujah. And that baptism should be in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to stand up. Yes. And you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Speaking in tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gives the utterance. There are so many leaders today trying to rob us of our faith. And of its supernatural origin, power, and glory. The devil is a liar. He's the father of lies. Let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? <laughs> Hallelujah. Judas telling us, uh, you've got to stand. You have this foundation. Don't let anybody mess with the foundation. Because if the foundation in what I just read out of Psalms, that's an Old Testament that's, that's an Old Testament piece of music. And he's saying if the foundation is destroyed, what are the righteous folk going to do? Hallelujah. Don't let people mess with the foundation. This is who we are. This is who we are. Hallelujah. Defend the faith. So we talked about what we're to defend. Why we should defend and I'm going to close out with this. How do we defend the faith? I'm glad you asked. How do we do it, Fields? I hear you talking. I hear you running your mouth. But how do we defend it? Well, Jude said we are to defend it earnestly. Yes. Verse number three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So Judah's saying you got to take some action. You got to take action. You can't just sit there in the midst of all that lying uh, and say amen. No. You got to take some action. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. And I'll read James 1 and 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. So we got to do it earnestly. Hallelujah. And we have to take action because that next verse in James says, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Hallelujah. Which is able to save your souls. Uh, and this is why the enemy wants us to take hold to the untruth. Hallelujah. So we could forfeit our salvation. So we can we can push away and reject the things that God has in store for us. Uh, and you got to fight. You got to contend. You have to fight 
you have to defend. Hallelujah. You have to win. You have to do whatever it takes. Hallelujah. Don't just sit there and say amen. Uh, and if you strive for masteries, uh, you won't be crowned unless you strive lawfully. Hallelujah. You won't get an, a reward if you're trying to do it your way. Jesus, even Jesus said, if you try to get into heaven any other way, and I'm para paraphrasing, he says you're a thief and a robber. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you can't do it your way or the way men have contrived. Nope. You have to do it according to what is subscribed in the word of God. And don't let anybody turn you around. Hallelujah. So how do we defend the faith? I wish I could teach this the way I feel it. How do we defend the faith? And there are three ways. Three ways I'm going to give you that we can defend the faith in these last days. Number one, by living it. Number one, there's no greater defense of the faith than a life that proves the reality and the beauty of being Christ-like. No better way. So we have to live this. We have to live it. We have to live. The just shall live by faith. Though we must speak the truth, listen to my notes, and stand up for it, we must do it all in love. Ephesians 4.15 I'm going to read for you. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Um, so I have to say there that in our defending the faith, uh, beware uh, that you don't become hard and uncharitable and unloving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, we live this thing. We practice what we preach and teach. Hallelujah. But we're doing it all in love. We're not becoming hard and looking down on people. You can't win people uh, and be nasty uh, and mistreat them uh, and say, well, I'm, I'm saved. You ain't saved. Get away from me. No, that's not the kind of attitude we should have. Live the faith. Live it. Beware of becoming hard and uncharitable uh, in defending what you believe. Uh, 1 Corinthians, that's the love chapter. Yes. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, 2, and 3. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Uh, you know, you see people speaking all these tongues and they're nasty, right? Uh, and and you can't win nobody being nasty. Hallelujah. You you can't you can't make it in showing no love. Uh, so that's that's a way of defending the faith. Uh, be loving. Though I have gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Wow. So the first way we defend the gospel, uh, defend the faith, is by living it. You see people look, looking at us on the outside talking about, I don't want none of that. You see how they act? They act, they act crazier than the folks out in the world. No, we have to live the faith. Hallelujah. That's a way of defending it. The second way we defend it is by proclaiming it. So we live it. We proclaim it. Right. Uh, where he says, preach the gospel. Uh, here, Paul telling Timothy in season and out of season. Uh, and I tell those you may not be a preacher, but uh, spread it. Give your testimony. Talk about the goodness of the Lord. Share the word. Hallelujah. Yes, the gospel, the positive certainties of the faith. This kills error quicker than anything else. Yeah, uh, proclaiming the truth 
One thing proclaiming the truth does, it exposes the lie. Hallelujah. The error has to be exposed. And if you shut your mouth and refuse to say what the truth is, uh, then the lie will just run down, run all around. But if you open your mouth with the truth, the truth has a way of exposing the error. Hallelujah. Uh, but by mainly, and listen to my notes, it does it by positive instruction. Hallelujah. There's correction, right? All scripture is given by inspiration. And one of those things the word of God does, it corrects, it instructs. Uh, but I have to say, and it's in my notes, don't be a kind of person, don't be a, heres a heresy hunter, right? Don't, don't go around snooping around for stuff and say, aha, I found something. No, uh, when you hear it, you'll know whether it's true or not. If you have the Holy Ghost and you really love the truth, and I think that's a problem today. Uh, some of the saints that are tongue talkers and, and have been working in the church, they, they, for some reason, it seems though they have lost their love for the word, for the truth, for the faith. Hallelujah. Uh, and they can't make up their mind what they want, what they want to hold on to. Uh, but uh, one of the things I have to tell you is you, if you... If you love something, you'll talk about it. You, you won't let anybody tear down something that you love. Uh, so you got to open up your mouth and proclaim. We got to live it and we have to proclaim it. And the third thing, um, a lot of us uh, might struggle with, and I'll be honest, uh, this is an area here that when I, when I talk about it, I cringe. Uh, because nobody, no one really wants to go through. But understand uh, that we will go through if we're going to live godly, if we're going to hold on to the truth, we will be ridiculed and some persecuted. Some of us will lose our lives. Um, so the third, the third thing after talking about we have to live it, we have to proclaim it. Uh, the third way we defend it is by suffering for it. Um, and I, I dare say you would have to come to a place where you're willing to suffer for it. Um, I think we're spoiled here in the United States, but in other countries where people have received Christ, they have been born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, they're being persecuted. Right now, as I speak in, in areas like Sudan, uh, the Muslims are killing born-again believers. They're, they're killing people that worship Jesus. I mean, literally. I don't mean like it is over here, people talking about you and, and uh, scandalizing your name. There are people who are holding on to Christ, who are losing, literally, in the year 2021, are losing their lives, having their heads cut off. For the cause of Christ, refusing to let go of the faith. They're contending, they're fighting, they're living it, they're proclaiming it, and they're even suffering for it. You got, we got folks today, somebody talk about you, you don't want to sing in the choir no more. I'm not going back to that church. Or you just go out back out into the world, right? Uh, and, and Paul if Paul was sitting in your living room, he'd point his finger in your face and say, this light affliction cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. My Lord, my Lord. Listen, um, we have to be willing to suffer as millions are today and millions have already suffered. Uh, our forefathers died for the gospel's sake. Our, our forefathers, our early brothers and sisters lost their lives and many have lost their lives in these times. Uh, and there's going to be persecution, more persecution and trouble and trials. And I know this, in pop, this isn't popular. This is totally contrary to what many of us are used to hearing, right? The prosperity gospel. And yes, God wants us to be in good health and prosper. All of that is true. But it's also true that many are going to go through for the cause of Christ. Uh, and we cannot run. We cannot run. 
We cannot run. Hallelujah. We can't run. We can't give up. Uh, let's go to Mark. I'm getting ready to close. 8 and 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Let's compare that to Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 42. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That'll preach shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Christ, my Lord. Acts 7, 54 and 60. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. This is Stephen while he's being stoned. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of, of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So these are three ways. And if I had more time, I'd go into other ways that we can defend the faith. But I've given you three. You got to live it, proclaim it. And there are going to be times when you'll have to suffer for it. Yes. But if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. We shall have trials in this world. We shall have tribulation. But I hear the word of God say, be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. So we've got to be contenders. We've got to be the kind of saint that's willing to open our mouths and proclaim the truth of God's word the truth of our faith. Jesus is real. Our salvation is real. This word is the unadulterated word of a living, breathing God. And this word is life. It is truth. It is strength. Every word of God in here, every word is going to come to pass. Every prophecy, hallelujah, everything that is mentioned is truth. And I believe it. I receive it. Hallelujah. And I'm looking forward to that great day. Hallelujah. And don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of your salvation. Don't be ashamed of your faith. I trust that I've said something that has been a blessing to you and strengthened you. I don't want to take too much more of your time. But I thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you. I look forward to this on every Wednesday coming together with the people of God. I want to pray for someone today. Uh, you have a special need of prayer. Put your name in the comment section. Yeah, I want to give you time to do so. Uh, and just say, uh, Pastor, pray for me. I want you to pray for me. Or Pastor, pray for my family. And before we pray, if you have a special request, something that you'd like me to lay on the altar, send it in. Admin at GRTDC. Dot org. And as I go before the Lord, I'll lay those requests out on the altar, I'll touching and agreeing with you, believing God that there'll be a move, a supernatural move of God in your life. Yes, uh, but you want me to pray for you? Let's establish that electronic prayer line as we go to the throne of grace. Father, we love you so much and we're so grateful. Hallelujah for your word. Uh, telling us today that we should contend for the faith. And there are those, Lord, who are putting their names on this prayer list. They have need of you. We're trusting in your word tells us about the power and the fervency of prayer. 
and that when we call, you will answer. We believe it. It's our faith, and we trust you. And we're bringing all of our problems and all of our pains to you. Oh, God, send deliverance, send healing, Lord. Hashandemo, glory, Jesus, send salvation. Hold back the hand of the enemy, I'm asking, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We count it done, and we receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you want to plant a seed, you want to pay your tithes a given offering, you may do so. Our technician will put that on the screen for us. And those of you who are at the Annex in the Bronx, uh, if you're sitting in the building, uh, either Elder Blackwood or uh, Mother Van can pass that basket. You can plant that seed or you can use Givelify. The Lord bless you and keep you. We have been enjoying this anniversary services that have been going on this month. The Lord has been blessing us here. Uh, and on last night, one of my sons in the gospel came and preached the word of God. Uh, Elder Purdy, we are so proud of him and his wife in their ministry, Agape Life Temple. Uh, keep on doing what you're doing, son. We love you. And we appreciate the ministry that God has given you. Uh, the Lord bless you. I'm looking forward to coming together on next week. Lord willing, we'll see each other. But until then, be careful, be prayerful, and be holy. Shalom. Shalom.